Hi friends, I'm uh, Dr. Deepak Bahuja and I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Aerolib Healthcare Solutions. Uh, we are a patient-centered total quality management firm and we provide um, consulting advice to healthcare organizations. I'd like to thank uh, Pennsylvania Medical Society for inviting us to speak on, on an important topic. And as you all know, Pennsylvania Medical Society has 20,000 physicians and medical students and is a key force in uh, advocacy for healthcare organizations, for physicians, for residents, for students in the healthcare field for Pennsylvania. As you can see in the slide below, the topic of discussion is clinical documentation, medical necessity, and RAC audits. Uh, I'd like to start uh, just a little bit about my background on how I got involved into this. I'm a board certified internist and pediatrician and started off as a primary care physician, moved into the hospitalist role for many years and then into case management and utilization. I did DRAC audits for two states in the Central America region and um, most of the times when we did uh, get cases, uh, my only question was, you know, there was so much documentation lapses, is why weren't the healthcare providers notified of these changes uh, so that we wouldn't get the cases in the first place? Now, as you already know, CMS has come out with the 1599F2 midnight determination ruling. Uh, a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of new regulations, a lot of sub-regulatory guidance on what constitutes um, a certified or authenticated order. Um, as a physician, I know it's uh, it's a little difficult trying to keep up with regulations, and uh, that's where we come in, is to act as a bridge between uh, regulations, CMS, hospital administration, and the physicians who are in the trenches. Um, we'll start off with uh, a case, and I'll tell you what documentation lapses could occur in that case. We will also periodically do questions on a two midnight quiz as we go along. We'll talk about uh, certain uh, reimbursement issues, ICD-10, and um, just uh, uh, let's start off with this first slide. Um, as you can see, the website is aerolib.com, and um, it has a few uh, free preview webinars. There's a DVD that uh, that's been developed to help uh, healthcare providers navigate the. Uh, different documentation uh, requirements. What we have taken is is a physician-based approach into um, guiding documentation based on disease-specific uh, DRGs, and we've taken the top 15 DRGs that a hospital admits that accounts for about 80% of the revenue, and um, uh, there'll be some uh, reference to that. Uh, more information is on the website. So let's start with the first slide. And as you can see, our objectives are case analysis, understanding and auditor's constraints, uh, importance of documentation, and we'll be talking about hospital reimbursement. Um, our case uh, starts off with the subheading as it's about semantics, and in a little while I'll tell you how. Let's take a look at this case. Uh, a 67-year-old patient comes in with a rectal bleed and a hemoglobin of 7 with a blood pressure of 89 by 67. Well, the admitting physician will put in a diagnosis of anemia, hypotension, and lower GI bleed. And the uh, question to us will be, is, is this case going to be denied? Now, this is a pretty standard case that we can see a hospitalist coming uh, in at 7 a.m., having 20 patients to round on, and the emergency room will page the on-call uh, accepting hospital is saying, well, here's this case, uh, could you come down and admit her? Um, my question uh, to, to a lot of case managers that come in, uh, as well as hospitalists to come in is, what would you put in as your final admitting diagnosis as an MDM? We're all very good at uh, dictating H&Ps um, and with uh, non-physician providers like nurse practitioners and physician assistants, the H&P is always done wonderfully. However, uh, the medical decision making in terms of what diagnosis needs to be put in, uh, there's a lot that can be done on that. So in this particular case, I'm going to read off my slide here. Unless we write something like this, uh, there's a high likely chance that this case will be denied by a RAC auditor later uh, after two or three years. 
So it's acute blood loss anemia with likely source of bleed from rectum with hemodynamic instability requiring two units of blood transfusion for stabilization with a history of polyps and atrial fibrillation. Unless something like this is written, uh, there's, a, there's a chance that the case will be denied. And it comes down to my second slide, which is it's all about semantics. Now, there's a, there's a huge definition of semantics, but what we're concerned is logical aspects of meaning. Can you portray what is going on with your patient in such a fashion that your colleagues or a non-specialist seeing this case based on your documentation three years later can figure it out? Uh, it, I think it's important to know what goes on inside the mind of an auditor. And prior to that, we'll talk about who the spectrum of auditors is. Now you can see from the green slabs, the certs and the QIOs um, will ask for basic information uh, and also provide guidance. As we go up the hierarchy, RACs, mix, and max, there's money involved. There's money that can be withheld. And if you look into the red zone, the ZPICs, the OIG, and finally the Department of Justice, that's where not only money but a lot of legal issues can come in. And so it's important to recognize who is going to be auditing your case. Now, when we talk about auditors, it's important to know what they look for. Well, clinical uh, criteria like medical necessity is, is always on the top. Uh, documentation that can justify medical necessity, and then coverage, procedures, and imaging. So let's talk about what goes on inside the mind of an auditor. And you have to realize each document is about 200 pages in, in a PDF uh, uh, size, and they usually get 15 to 25 minutes a case. Now, the person auditing your case could be a physician with extensive experience or a nurse who's just started this job as her first paraclinical portion. So it could be a physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, or an RN. And initially, uh, auditors were looking at inpatient or observation. When we look at the definition uh, of medical necessity under the Social Security Act, you can see that these are services that are reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of illness or injury to improve the functioning of a malformed body member. Try explaining that to your physician group on how to justify medical necessity. Well, my advice is we need to assume differences until similarity is proven. We need to emphasize on the descriptive rather than the interpretation. And we need to put ourselves as physicians or, or uh, people who are, who are doing h &Ps or taking care of inpatients in the auditor's frame of reference. I talk about red flags within documentation for hospitalists. And this was a, an article I published in, in 2011 I think the goal was to make a defensible medical record. And the idea is to paint a picture of clarity of the patient condition, not only at the time of presentation, but on each and every day that a progress note is being written. This is what a, a schematic cartoon of a hospital would look like. And if this is how the notes are, there's going to be an issue because auditors request this sort of detail. And if you don't put this sort of detail, this is what it looks like to them. Now we talk about smart documentation, and in clinical terms, these are words or, or, or semantic terms like acidosis, alkalosis, atelectasis, documentation of BMI, cachexia, dementia, gastrostomy tube. Uh, the list goes on with words like dementia, encephalopathy, COPD, asthma, words that a clinical person can understand and decipher that your patient really needed to be in the hospital, and this is two or three years from that event. ICD-10 is coming later uh, this year in October, and how that's, that affects us is a lot more specificity in documentation. Use of acute or chronic, right or left, uh, in cases of orthopedics, normal healing, delayed healing, non-union, malunion, and then in each episode, whether this is the first episode or is it a subsequent effort. Complications of comorbid conditions as well as major comorbid conditions, very important to know how you can 
paint your picture of severity of illness for your patient. Now this significantly increases that as well as gives information about morbidity, mortality, uh, length of stay and is also useful for utilization review purposes. It can bump up the DRG as well as the payments received by the hospital. And I'll give you some examples as we move along. So let's take an example for hospital reimbursement for a GI hemorrhage. Now if this is a simple GI hemorrhage with a secondary diagnosis of CHF, that's a DRG of 379 without any CCs or MCCs and that can get your hospital roughly about $4,000. You start documenting more on this patient saying that there is a secondary diagnosis of congestive heart failure and you can bump that payment up to 5900 Even more specific documentation about the acuteness of the systolic heart failure the DRG goes up to 377 and reimbursement is 9700 This is actual numbers from a hospital in Pennsylvania near the Philadelphia area. Well, what is the documentation needed to support a GI hemorrhage? I think it's pretty obvious. A lot of people know this, do this, uh, use of blood urea nitrogen, hemoglobin, uh, documentation of, uh, of hemodynamic stability with blood pressures, presence of syncope, melina, hepatic disease, cardiac failure. And again, documentation of these uh, in objective criteria, not only of the day of admission, but on subsequent progress notes also. My advice is to use prediction tools. Anything that works to support your diagnosis on how sick your patient is, evidence-based criteria. In this particular case, the use of the Glasgow Blatchford score if it is a pneumonia diagnosis, use of the CURB score, uh, but use some form of, of uh, evidence-based medicine proven prediction tools. When we look at ICD-10, we know October 1st this year, it is going to replace ICD-9. Um, initially, we only had three DRGs for GI hemorrhage, 377, 78, and 379. With ICD-10, that expands a lot more diagnosis for GI hemorrhage. And you can see, um, in terms of hemorrhage, they are trying to figure out if you can localize the source of the bleed or the anatomical location of the bleed. When we look at coding tips, again, use of secondary diagnosis, asthma exacerbation, COPD with exacerbation. I'm not going to read the list, but feel free to look at it in the handout. In our particular case, I've underlined the GI bleed where again, GI bleed due to gastritis or some other condition. Again, noting that auditors and, and people who are looking at your charts want to know whether you thought of where the path pathology and the anatomical location of that disease is. In our next slide, come, we come back uh, to where we started. It's all about semantics. And what we have done is created the uh, Aerolib Healthcare Solutions Disease Specific Inpatient Documentation DVD. It talks about some topics about CMS 1599 updates, the spectrum of regulators, the importance of documentation. Um, we've talked about red flags in documentation, hospital reimbursement, secondary diagnosis, and then ICD 10 updates. We've covered pretty much diseases that hospitalists and hospitals see on a daily basis asthma, pneumonia, chest pain, COPD, syncope atrial fibrillation, TIA, renal failure, seizures, CHF, sepsis, pulmonary embolism, acute MI, UTI, and GI hemorrhage. And I think this covers our, our 80 to 90 percent of the, the reimbursement that the hospital usually gets. Uh, that's excluding cardiac and uh, neurosurgical procedures. And again, we'll talk about those in, in a future webinar. I want to thank you as well as the Pennsylvania Medical Society for inviting uh, Aerolib uh, to showcase what we do. Um, our website is www.aerolib.com and you can reach me at aerolib at live.com. Again, thank you very much. Uh, this is Dr. Pahuja. Hi friends, welcome to part two of the webinar where we're going to talk about the CMS 1599 rule that was passed by Medicare in August with an start date of 1st October. Well, this is the inpatient hospital admission and medical review criteria and more commonly known as the two midnight provision. Um, 
Part B billing in the hospital is part of the uh, 1599 and 1455F regulations. The total rule is about 2,200 pages and its implementation date was 1st October 2013. What is most uh, useful to us is uh, Chapter 11, 13 Part C from pages 1781 to 1851. And these talk about payment policies related to patient status and they give instructions about physician orders and certifications. What is important is the inpatient hospital admission and medical review criteria, which is in 42 CFR 412.3 onwards, where the requirement for the order, requirement for the need, uh, as well as requirement of information to justify admission and continued stays is mentioned. A lot of this is in the Medicare Claims Processing Manual and the Medicare General Information Eligibility Entitlement uh, is part of uh, the rules. Now there is a verbal order policy, signature requirements, order policy, and what CMS gives us is guidance on hospital in inpatient admission decisions. There is a background as well as guidance uh, reference to the program integrity manual as well as the Medicare benefits policy manual. When we look at the integrity manual guidance, they give us admission criteria as well as guidance for invasive procedures. Uh, they refer to see a published CMS criteria and other screens criteria and guidelines. Um, the Medicare benefits policy manual actually goes further by telling us the need for the severity of signs and symptoms, the medical probability of an adverse event, the need for diagnostic studies, and availability of diagnostic procedures. This is referenced in Chapter 1, Section 10. I think the bottom line is how does it affect physicians or healthcare providers? And there is a major shift from complex medical decision making criteria to a time based definition. An inpatient is now described as an expectation that the patient would require care greater than two midnights. So the decision to admit should be based on the cumulative time spent at the hospital, beginning with the initial outpatient service. So the decision to admit should be based on the cumulative time spent at the hospital beginning with the initial outpatient service. Physician needs to consider the time spent in the ED and observation services and for all this documentation is critical. So the two midnight rule uh, talks about when a patient should be inpatient. A one ER midnight plus one inpatient midnight means inpatient. A one's one observation midnight and a one inpatient midnight equals inpatient. Two inpatient midnights is inpatient. Question comes is when two obs midnights? Well, initially, based on medical necessity, the hospital could bill obs, but again, if the patient has crossed two midnights, then inpatient is deemed applicable and can be billed as part A, as long as medical just necessity is justified. Now there are some exceptions to the two midnight rule, inpatient only procedures listed in the CMS uh, Appendix E on the outpatient side do not require two midnights, inpatient only surgeries do not have any time criteria, uh, skilled nursing facility placement still requires three inpatient midnights and emergency room or OBS midnight do not count towards the skilled nursing facility placement. They, however, will count to meet the two midnight benchmark for inpatient, however, not the three inpatient midnights required for uh, a skilled nursing facility placement. Um, CMS has uh, made it very clear that overnight ICU stay would be observation unless there is a second midnight involved. Again, critical documentation for death, transfers, or patient leaving against medical advice as long as the presumption is there that the patient would cross two midnights, however, in total time does not, these would still be applicable for inpatient. 
CMS does talk about certification of care uh, where an appropriate order is required. The reasons for hospitalization have been stated along with the diagnosis and the expected time the patient will remain in the hospital. Like for all orders, as CMS has told before, they need to be signed, dated, um, and timed by the authenticating physician. They have not specified a, a specific format. However, the documentation needs to contain the information as stated below. Admit as inpatient to Dr. ABC, to the floor, IMU, or ICU. There needs to be a diagnosis. There needs to be an expectation of the stay greater than two midnights or less than two midnights. Condition of the patient, whether stable or unstable. Signature, contact information with phone and pager and date and time. In all these things, question is, where is the audit risk? Now, medical cases with an expectation uh, of stay less than two midnights uh, will not qualify as inpatients, and so Part B billing needs to follow it there. Now, one day ICU stays for GI bleed, seizures, atrial fibrillation, simple pneumonia will come under review. In fact, under more sub-regulatory guidance and open-door forums, CMS has stated that any one midnight uh, or one day inpatient is, uh, will be considered for review. However, if the benchmark and the review states that the patient crossed two midnights, then that uh, payment will be approved. Uh, in all documentation, intensity of the service uh, needs to be documented in the medical record. Um, again, for all these to be applicable, um, patient needs to be justified to be in the hospital in the first place. Now, on September 5th, sub-regulatory guidance was released uh, where physician certification requirements uh, were clarified and uh, they talk about an authentication of the practitioner's order uh, requiring a reason for the inpatient stay, estimated time of stay, and uh, plans for post-hospital care. Um, uh, the critical access hospitals have a 96-hour criteria, and that needs to be followed. Now, there's been some considerable question on who has the authorization to sign the certification, and CMS has always said physicians, an MD or a DO, um, uh, are allowed to sign the certification order. They have clarified that the physician responsible for the care, the on-call physician uh, for the surgeon performing the surgery or an on-call associate, or a physician member of the utilization review committee who has reviewed the case and has direct patient care responsibility. A certification needs to be signed, dated, and timed at the time of admission but definitely before discharge. And there's been some considerable debate on the timing of uh, the certification sign, especially in lieu of electronic medical records uh, where orders have been put in um, and um, uh, they are flagged for the authentication, authenticating physician to sign. However, um, sometimes that is not possible uh, prior to discharge, especially in short stays. Now, the admitting uh, uh, practitioner has been noted to be a physician assistant, resident, or uh, registered nurse. They may take verbal orders, telephone orders from the practitioner who is qualified as a certifying physician. And so orders like admit to inpatient verbal order Dr. Smith, admit to inpatient per Dr. Smith um, are, are applicable and, and are accepted. Uh, as long as Dr. Smith meets qualifications to be a certifying physician. Now, according to the final rule, the order must specify the admitting practitioner's recommendation. And so uh, semantics uh, such as admit to inpatient, admit as inpatient, admit for inpatient services, or similar language uh, will be accepted as an inpatient order. CMS has clarified that language uh, stated below which should be billed as outpatient or as Part B, and, and that is admit to the ER, admit to observation, admit to recovery, admit to an outpatient surgery or day surgery or short day surgery. I think what all this means is 
that documentation is key to justifying an inpatient status and medical necessity. Um, as I stated in part A of this webinar, um, use of evidence-based criteria, prediction tools, use of semantic words that CMS recognizes, uh, as well as their RACs and MACs recognize to justify uh, that the patient, one, needs to be in the hospital, not only at the time of presentation, but on every subsequent progress note. What we discuss uh, in the next uh, portion of the CMS is a quiz that we created and we'll go over that. So we'll be talking about the CMS 1599 quiz, uh, which is based on eight questions. And this is available at aerolib.com. We go on to quiz, scroll down, and the Aerolib Healthcare Solutions CMS 1599 uh, to midnight quiz. And this is based on eight questions on one patient scenario. And I'll read this, uh, which is an 88-year-old female presenting from the nursing home to the emergency department at 9 p.m. day one with one day history of slurring of speech, facial droop, and left-sided lower extremity weakness. Her past medical history is significant for diabetes and hypertension. Her initial CT scan of the brain is negative for an acute bleed. Neurological examination shows expressive aphasia, but no motor or sensory deficits. Now she is hospitalized under observation for acute onset of confusion with concern for probable acute CVA and is admitted to neurological floor with orders for IV fluids, aspirin, echocardiogram, carotid ultrasound, MRI of the brain, and a neurology consultation. So let's get started with the first uh, scenario on this patient is that on day two, her blood pressure falls to 40, 70 by 40 and she's tachypneic with respiratory rate of 24. MRI of the brain is put on hold due to hemodynamic instability and she is transferred to the ICU. I think, uh, uh, well, over 600 people have taken this quiz and this question has been right by uh, about 95% of the quiz takers. And this uh, feels that this could be inpatient because there's a presumption that she'll be in the hospital for greater than two midnights due to hemodynamic instability, the need for further monitoring in an ICU setting. When we go on to alternate scenario two, this patient actually feels better and is recommended discharge back to the nursing home with continuation of aspirin. Now she was initially put in as observation She's, she's uh, stayed uh, for one midnight, she's better and she's going back. Uh, the correct answer should be to continue observation status since she's only crossed one midnight. In scenario three, she feels better and is recommended discharge back to the nursing home with continuation of aspirin. Her family, however, wants to take her back home but needs to readjust the home furniture and thus request that patients stay another day so they can make changes to the house. Now, in all time essence, she will have crossed two midnights uh, if the hospital and the physician agree to this family's demands that she stay in the midnight. Question is, does the second midnight meet medical necessity? And if we, I, I would say this would be an observation since a medically justified one midnight is there. And the reasoning for, for this answer is, CMS says custodial care does not qualify as justification for a patient to even be in the hospital, and thus the two midnight rule may not apply. Now, if something happened to this patient uh, after the first midnight requiring medical care or need, uh, where she crossed the second midnight, then yes, switching her to inpatient would be very appropriate. Now in scenario four, instead of a stable clinical hospitalization, uh, on day one at 11 p.m., she develops worsening right-sided weakness and a stat CT scan of the bra uh, brain shows extensive left-sided bleed. She's intubated due to respiratory compromise and she's changed to inpatient admission status on day two, her family decides that they want to take her home with hospice and she is discharged at 5 p.m. Now this is the reverse of the previous scenario where she has stayed one midnight 
and there is presumption that she would have crossed to midnight since she's intubated. However, in all reality, she has stayed in the hospital only for uh, greater than one midnight. Now, the status was changed to inpatient, and I would continue the inpatient status with reasoning, saying that the presumption for greater than two midnights was correct, and CMS has notified that in cases where family and patient have requested for hospice, it may come under medical review for a short inpatient hospital stay, but once the contractor reviews the case, Part A payment will be approved. In question five, um, similar to what we had in, in question four, uh, day one at 11 p.m., she develops worsening, right-sided weakness, stat CT of the brain shows extensive left-sided bleed, She's intubated due to respiratory compromise, changed to inpatient status, and on day two, they want her transferred to a tertiary facility where she's transferred at 5 p.m. on that same day. So she has stayed, um, uh, she's, her stay has crossed one midnight in hospital one, and now she's being transferred to a tertiary facility. Um, again, I would continue this as inpatient with the reasoning that the presumption for greater than two midnights was correct. And CMS has said that in cases where the physician, the family and patient have requested transfer to a tertiary facility, part A payment will be approved, however, after medical review of this short inpatient hospital stay. When we look at question six, uh, six uh, similar question, um, day one at 11 p.m., uh, right-sided weakness, uh, extensive bleed on the CT scan, and she's changed to inpatient status. However, at day two at 9 a.m., she develops VTAC, code blue is called, and unfortunately, she expires. Inpatient, again, is appropriate in this scenario uh, with CMS's uh, recommendation that if a patient expires, even though they know this is going to be a short inpatient stay, Part A payment will be approved due to the presumption of stay greater than two midnights by the physician. In question seven, uh, at day one, 11 p.m., she reports increasing difficulty breathing and is intubated for respiratory failure. And then the physician advisor pages you around 11 p.m. for your opinion. Now, CMS uh, did release guidance on this, and I'm going to say inpatient because they have noted that a new unintended mechanical ventilation is an exception to the two midnight rule and is eligible for Part A payment. CMS feels that an unintended mechanical intubation will most likely cross two midnights. In the last question here, uh, an alternate scenario, uh, day one at 11 p.m., she develops increasing left-sided weakness and a repeat CT scan of the brain shows an intracranial bleed with mass effect. Um, she, the neurosurgeon comes in, uh, gets, she gets an urgent craniotomy for pressure reduction, and your physician advisor again pages you 11 p.m. Uh, in this case, it's appropriate to change to inpatient, uh, reasoning being that craniotomy is in the CMS inpatient-only surgical procedure list, and irrespective of uh, this patient's length of stay, the severity of illness, or location of services, uh, as long as there is justification for that procedure, Part A payment is very appropriate. Uh, like I said uh, um, in the past, about 600 people have taken this quiz. Um, there's been variation in the answers to about six of these questions, just showing that physician advisors, case managers, CMOs, hospital compliance officers who have taken this, um, the, the same group of people whom we feel are experts there is still a wide uh, variety in the interpretation of CMS rules. Combined with that, um, the open door forums have added some more confusion uh, to what uh, uh, interpretations CMS re uh, is, is requiring. Uh, and then Rax and Max have their own um, interpretation of the rules, putting hospitals, physicians, and uh, case managers in, in, in a little confusing situation. Now, we've also developed the Condition Code 44 quiz. Again, this is a simple four quiz. Uh, about 200 people have taken that, and uh, this one has far more variation. Um, my recommendation is to go on to aerolib.com um, slash quiz 
and uh, try this out with your uh, hospital teams, physicians, and, and try and gauge and start an internal discussion on uh, where the knowledge lapses, where the interpretation is different. And uh, we'd be more than happy to, to come in to, to do in-house presentations to your group. Uh, our contact information is at the website. And again, thank you for uh, listening to us. Thanks again to the Pennsylvania Medical Society for inviting us. Um, feel free to email me or call me if you have questions.